I'm Laura Shefsack, scientific editor at Self, and I'm here today with Maria Jason from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Hi, Maria. Hi. Maybe we can just start off and you can tell me what the main focus of your lab is. Well, uh, we study homologous recombination and uh, from more of its genetic uh, requirement um, rather than biochemistry, mm -hmm. uh, homologous recombination is a key DNA repair pathway in mammalian cells and we study it both in cell culture and in mice and uh, also uh, in germ cell development uh, because it's essential for meiosis. So kind of a broad range of, um, of systems uh, but recombination is critical in, in all of those in DNA repair, mouse development and uh, for my meiosis. So. Uh, germ cells can be developed, so uh, quite, quite a broad program, but each area is very exciting, we think. Mm -hmm. and, and what aspect of that are you going to talk about uh, here at the symposium? At the cell culture work that we've been doing, uh, so we, uh, critical proteins in the recombination process are tumor suppressors, mm -hmm. and in fact, breast cancer tumor suppressors, primarily BRCA1 and BRCA2, and uh, BRCA2, b besides being a breast cancer suppressor, it's also an ovarian cancer suppressor, but it's been found more recently to be uh, important in other cancers and somatic uh, mutations as well as germline mutations, which either affects the development of the disease uh, and or the treatment of the disease. Uh, and uh, so um, we wanna know what, what's so important about BRCA2 um, in, uh, in, in cellular responses and, um, and eventually leading to uh, tumor suppression. So our, our model is specifically to look at a relatively normal uh, breast uh, cell line, a non-transformed cell line called MCF10A. And uh, we uh, luckily have now the tools to make conditional knockouts fairly easily in mammalian cells, especially human cells that were more difficult to work with in the past. And so condition, we made conditional alleles and showed that BRCA2 was uh, absolutely essential. Uh, and, uh, and so we want to find out uh, why and uh, how tumor cells get around the fact that this is an essential uh, protein. And so I mean, there's actually a fair bit known about BRCA2. So what, how does what you're finding differ from kind of conventionally how we think about that protein? Right, so um, uh, there's been a lot of work in uh, the area of homologous recombination and, and the biochemical roles of uh, BRCA2 and other proteins. Uh, BRCA2 is very critical for loading the RAD51 uh, protein, mm -hmm. the, the main strand exchange protein in the cell. And um, a lot of people study it, uh, if not biochemically, in cells by looking at, um, uh, at kind of standard repair assays, some of which we developed to mm -hmm. look at double-strand break repair. Uh, and, but uh, we also discovered that it has an important role in protecting stalled replication forks. And the, uh, a, a critical thought for the whole homologous recombination field is that BRCA2, well, homologous recombination is critical for uh, every replication, every S phase to mm -hmm. repair spontaneous DNA damage that uh, comes up. And so we wanted to, to really understand uh, as best we could uh, what's being disrupted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we <clears throat> had focused on these two um, pathways for a while, considering homologous recombination per se was a, quite a critical pathway, but we found this other pathway of replication for uh, protection, which uh, recently was proposed in uh, mouse cells to be um, the reason why BRCA2 is essential and that in fact does not re require the repair role of BRCA2. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yet when we started looking at separation of function alleles in, in these human breast cancer cells, we really do find that um, homologous recombination and not this um, protection of nascent strands is really critical for the survival um, of those cells. And we don't think it's necessarily the, the kind of standard two-ended break, but um, from replication structures uh, that 
in the end, we'll need a uh, homologous re recombination to repair those breaks. And why do you think there's the difference between human and mouse? Well, uh, the, <coughs> the mouse system was uh, an ESL system, mm -hmm. and uh, ESLs, mouse ESLs, embryonic stem cells, uh, have different responses to DNA jam damage. Um, they're primarily in S phase and have very short gap phases. Okay. And, uh, and so an interesting thing for us was to find when we, uh, when we knocked out BRCA2, the cells did not arrest in S phase, but they actually continued mm -hmm. uh, to the next G1 and accumulated in G1. And that, in a way, solves um, a kind of major uh, issue, which is that often we see P53 mutations associated with BRCA1 and 2 yeah. tumors, and if the cells are accumulating in G1, then an easy way to get past that is to have a uh, P53 right. mutation. So it's very surprising in a way that S phase damage can continue on uh, through G2, through M phase, and even into the following uh, G1 mm -hmm. and uh, create issues. And, and so uh, uh, this S phase damage uh, really can hang around for a long time and create problems for the cells. But and so if there's, if there's S phase damage that persists, I mean, do you see aberrant Aberrancies in mitosis? Yes, or? yes. So um, uh, a lot of the very typical uh, aberrations, so uh, bridges, ultrafine bridges that we heard, just heard about, mm -hmm. um, lagging chromosomes, micronuclei, okay. so all those classic uh, things. And, uh, and then interestingly, this attempt to uh, uh, complete DNA replication in mitosis, right. so we see mitotic DNA replication um, in the BRCA2 mm -hmm. mutant cells. Uh, and uh, so we think that may be an attempt to, to uh, deal with these structures that may make it into mitosis, but, um, uh, but it, that's not sufficient. It may help alleviate some of the damage, but um, it doesn't, it uh, can't deal with the remaining damage from leftover from S phase. Mm -hmm. So in, the, in G2, we see markers of DNA damage in uh, metaphase, we see metaphase chromosomes mm -hmm. with uh, replication and uh, uh, FANCT2 foci, which are also associated with replication and uh, damage, and then the uh, mitotic structures leading to these 53 BP1 bodies, huge, um, uh, different from regular foci, but these huge conglomerations of repair uh, foci again, which should be um, uh, an attempt to repair this uh, this persistent damage, but again, is insufficient. Maybe because okay. those cells uh, can't do uh, recombination; they can't do it in the previous S phase, and they can't do it in the subsequent S phase. So things just fall apart. And so now that you're you're thinking about two different ways that that BRCA2 can operate, what's the next step for you? Well, we're we're still interested in in um, what are the particular issues? We don't think it's necessarily common fragile sites or okay. centromeres or some of the things, again, that we just heard about. Uh, uh, so are there particular sequences at um, BRCA2? Because replication just doesn't stop. It's there's uh, uh, a disc probably a discrete number of, uh, of sites that mm -hmm. have issues, and um, do those have any common features and why why is recombination particularly necessary for those so that that's a particular interest and then the next phase would be actually p53 uh, will rescue these colonies but they're uh, they're tiny and mm -hmm. so what else um, uh, do do we need for a full rescue uh, of the cells and that that brings us to you know in the in the breast for example when you have um, mutant cells, uh, you've lost heterozygosity, you have t now two BRCA2 mutant alleles. Mm -hmm. uh, what are those first steps that may occur that allow those cells to survive and go on to form a tumor? Okay. And so what are, what are your early indications sort of on that front? Because you said you, you, know, you, you do work you know, sort of not just in tissue cultural but also with specific. Right. So. 
Uh, well, one of the, the projects we'd like to develop is um, what, what are the actual rates of loss of heterozygosity okay. um, and does a breast differ from that? We, we can find that, uh, that uh, mammary cells in the animal, we've, de we've developed a uh, in vivo tissue recombination okay. uh, assay and, and we, can, we can find that. The breast, at least in our initial assays, doesn't seem, the mammary gland in mice do, doesn't seem to have any preferential use of BRCA1 or 2 in recombination, but it seems to use recombination as a, at a higher level. So um, uh, is that because there's generally more damage or these bursts of replication? Um, and, uh, and, and so that, does that cause a different dynamic in those cells compared to other cells? How does that assay work? I don't, I'm not familiar oh, with Oh, so it. we, um, kind of our very popular uh, GFP reporter, two uh, defective GFP genes, we introduce a break into mm -hmm. one of them, and if the cells undergo recombination, they become GFP plus. So mm -hmm. we can very nicely okay. see in the tissue architecture, uh, basal cells, luminal cells becoming okay. GFP po positive, and we can quantify those. So it's, an, it's a nice in vivo assay, it, it, uh, it showed us how robust recombination can be even in the, in the background of a pretty f proficient non-homologous end joining pathway. Uh, and, uh, and so we think that'll be useful for parsing out some of these things. Mm -hmm. And when you got started, I mean, was it looking, looking at this process in, in mammalian cells, was it, was it obvious that it was going to be as abundant and vital Recombination. Yeah, actually, um, when I set up my lab, when I was interviewing for jobs, um, I, I told everybody I was going to work on meiotic recombination, and uh, and that was because we didn't think, uh, coming from a background of doing gene targeting, we didn't think homologous recombination was very important in mammalian cells for DNA repair. Mm -hmm. And um, starting out when I did, uh, the tools for doing mouse meiotic work were starting, but certainly there was not much set up and we, we did an experiment where we introduced a break into the genome and asked how it's repaired. Mm -hmm. And you know, the kind of the basic um, experiment for how CRISPR works and, and these other um, pathways. And we saw non-homologous end joining events, mutagenic events, but then we also saw quite robustly uh, homologous recombination events. And so that actually switched my focus at the very beginning of my career to studying homologous recombination in, in uh, cell culture mm -hmm. um, to, to understand it. So a time when this field, um, we had no players in the, in the process, mm -hmm. um, very little was known. People only would study very rare uh, spontaneous events, but when we introduced damage, we, we had a very robust assay, assay and, and um, and then luckily a few years later, uh, there were connections being made with the tumor suppressors mm -hmm. and uh, genomic analysis uh, indi indicating hom homologs of yeast recombination genes. And mm -hmm. so the field's been um, uh, incredibly um, interesting and stimulating mm -hmm. uh, ever since that point. So I feel lucky as a young PI to, to have started in a field that was um, uh, so small uh, and um, unknown, um, and uh, yet it's it's really blossomed, and lots of colleagues, and lots of implications for human health mm -hmm. and uh, uh, interesting mechanisms. So, and so, when you have trainees leaving your lab, do you do you advise them to try and find a similar situation? Well, I, you know, I, everybody invests a lot of time in um, their particular project as a postdoc, and yeah. they, they try and find uh, a, a niche from that. Um, in a way, I th it, it was risky, I think, a little bit when I started my career to try something so different, but um, Sloan Kettering had good funding at that time to allow me to do that. And I, I do think it's a little uh, scary these days, uh, even more so, to try and develop something completely different, but um, I think it's very rewarding um, and so certainly uh, can lead to a very impactful uh, scientific career. Seems like you need some tenacity <laughs> to stick with it. So let me, let me switch gears a little okay. bit. So how has, how has the advent of CRISPR, I mean, it's, it's changing a lot of areas of science, but I would think for this field in particular, it would have a big impact. In, you know, uh, people have not 
uh, used it uh, hugely, I think, in terms of actually asking repair uh, questions. I think that's going to change somewhat. Um, mm -hmm. We started out uh, in the 90s using um, the IAC one end nuclease, mm -hmm. which is a single chain 200 uh, some amino acid uh, nuclease, very specific. And, uh, and so that's been the, the workhorse. Um, and we can use CRISPR um, in our GFP assays, uh, Cas9, to introduce breaks. And, uh, but I, I think um, the main power of, of CRISPR is um, the genome-wide applications mm -hmm. uh, or uh, the um, attempts that you can um, have with it to do genome-wide um, repair assays and uh, get a lot of information that way. So I, I think th that kind of thing is going to develop but isn't quite here. But of course, everybody's using it for all the standard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we make translocations. Uh, 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 by introducing breaks on two chromosomes, mm -hmm. um, we uh, use it to knock out genes, make additional genes, yeah. just like everybody else yeah. in every other field. Um, yeah. So and so, I'm I'm curious about. So we talked a little about kind of what the next immediate questions are. If you were thinking three to five years down the road, what what question do you want to be able to answer? But like regardless of whether or not the technology exists. Well, now. I um, I would really like. I know we I touched on this, but um, if in three to five years I had an answer for why some cell types are so prone to tumor genesis when mm -hmm. uh, homologous recombination is disrupted, I'd, I'd be very happy for <laughs> finally understanding that um, conundrum. But uh, um, so that's that's kind of a, a major issue for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I also love um, the meiotic uh, recombination work that we do, uh, which is primarily in collaboration with Scott Keeney, and mm -hmm. that's a case where uh, hundreds of double-strand breaks are introduced in the genome, and, and the um, specific parts of that that are, are so unique and um, this huge genome-wide uh, damage, mm -hmm. so that's another um, aspect that um, I'm hoping in the next three to five years will have some, some new insight into. So we haven't talked about that at all. So on, on the work that you do in, in meiosis and the, and the massive number of breaks, what's the, most ex what's the thing in the lab that you're most excited about right now? Well, uh, we have been doing um, assays at specific, so now we have nucleotide resolution maps of mm -hmm. where double-strand breaks occur. And uh, we're, we're learning a lot of, about the um, proteins that are involved in that. And uh, uh, we have done assays at specific um, sites of break formation to understand how they're repaired and the importance of um, crossovers so um, the homologs can stay together, but also the importance of uh, non-crossovers so the homologs can get together uh, to begin with. But there are a lot of um, uh, proteins that are involved in the process that are, um, are problematic in patients. Uh, okay. ATM is a, a major one that uh, leads to infertility mm -hmm. in males and females. And, I um, didn't know that. Yeah, and oh. so, um, yeah, it's, uh, of course, because um, the patients have issues uh, well before their um, reproductive uh, ages. Um, the germ cell issues are, are often kind of overlooked, um, but yeah, um, ATM is an incredibly interesting protein in meiosis because of its unique role in, um, in regulating the number of double-strand breaks, so, uh, so it, there's about tenfold more uh, double-strand breaks in an ATM mutant um, compared okay. to normal. Where do all those breaks go? What, um, what is, is happening, um, and is this even causing issues in um, heterozygous individuals is, is something that we'd uh, like to know, and, um, and it's not just the number of breaks, it's the, um, the spatial distribution of them. We think ATM is probably uh, in part acting like a normal, uh, like it normally does in mitosis, uh, responding to breaks and signaling. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but in this case, um, it's, it's t in the end to provide a feedback to regulate the number of, of breaks, but also probably the spatial positioning. And so if 
uh, is it um, is it really that once you get a break on one chromatid, it's going to suppress breaks on the other chromatids and breaks in the in the vicinity, mm -hmm. and um, and how how important is this if we start having uh, now uh, let's say in a heterozygous situation in, in a patient uh, or in a carrier, um, uh, are, is there some redistribution of breaks that are, is going to cause genome rearrangements or, or other things. So, um, so I'd really like to be able to explore these really um, fine maps mm -hmm. of, uh, in our knowledge about break formation and uh, understand what happens in some, some of these pathological situations. That'll be very cool. Yeah. That'll be very cool. So one, one, one last question. Yes. Um, if you were starting over brand new right now, if you don't have a lab, you can ask any question you want. Somebody's handing you money to do it, but you can't work on a combination. What do you do? Well, I, um, I maybe I should be more ambitious, but I, um, I guess you know, at heart, there's the biologist in me, mm -hmm. and one of the things I really love about CRISPR is um, that you can so readily go to other organisms, uh, uh, non-model organisms, mm -hmm. to to make them models um, and to understand their specific biology. So uh, that would be great fun for me. Um, and I would love to take a year off and explore all the yeah. options that are out there. It doesn't quite fit with um, the cancer biology emphasis, but of uh, Sloan Kettering. But I think that would be a fun way to, to, um, to develop a career, yeah. That's great. All right, Maria, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks.